I want to welcome you. I am Linda Selman, Chair of the Theater Committee at the National Arts Club. This evening, we are excited to present Festival of Monologues, written and performed by three seasoned writers whose themes touch upon diverse ethnic and sexual perspectives. Each one shares surprising incidents about the author's own life that reveal intimate truths. Unexpected revelations emerge, sometimes startling or poignant or even life-changing. This dynamic is one of the supreme joys of the monologue as a theatrical form. We're also delighted to conclude the evening with a Q&A. So please wait until the end of the third piece to place your questions in the chat box. And for those of you who, do, who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, let me tell you, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, lectures, readings, and performances. For more information, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you are interested in becoming a member, please email us at admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. Our first piece is entitled Earthbound by Paul Naraki, an off-Broadway actor turned writer whose work has been published in literary magazines such as Bittersweet and The Fig and is presently showcasing with and theater company, Anything Goes. Next is Camp Cook by Sarah Bracey White, writer, arts consultant, most motivational speaker and author and primary lessons of uh, she is the author of Primary Lessons, a memoir, and Wanderlust, a South Carolina folktale. Our third and last piece is The Middle Ground by David Masello, a playwright and essayist whose pieces have been produced by Chelsea Rep, Manhattan Repertory Theater, and in Best American Essays. Thank you and enjoy the evening. My father was a policeman and my mother was a telegrapher for Western Union. How they met is very interesting, but that's another story. <clears throat> my parents were friends with Tony and Gracie Arena, two superlatively ethnic Italians, both of them short, round, like a perfectly matched pair of salt and pepper shakers. Gracie took great pride in her Italian cooking, and we would often be invited to their overly warm apartment, steamy from the smell and steamy from boiling pasta and fragrant from oregano, basil, and garlic. My parents in the arenas would talk and laugh in the kitchen, while my older brother and I would stay in the living room watching television. One Sunday night, when I was about five or six, we were watching the Ed Sullivan show. The arenas had a very nice television, as Tony would always brag, a 21 inch zenith in a dark wood cabinet. On this Sunday night, Ed Sullivan was particularly thrilled to present the Bolshoi Ballet, noting that they had come all the way from Russia the screen was suddenly alive with fairy-like women on their toes, twirling and bending effortlessly. 
instantly the muscular male dancers joined them on stage, first lifting and turning the ballerinas as if they were weightless, which was amazing enough in itself. But magically, several of the male dancers began doing what appeared to be impossible feats. Without warning or any apparent exertion, they would fly up into the air. As they were airborne, they would move their legs back and forth with such audacity that it was as if they were saying, you think that leap was something? Look what we can do while we're up here. I was mesmerized. I never knew anything like this was possible, and I envied their magical ability to ignore gravity and soar skyward. I long to be able to escape the bounds of Earth instead of being stuck on the ground with my mother, who I would someday realize was probably undiagnosed bipolar. It opened a door inside me that I never knew existed. I immediately ran to the kitchen to tell everyone the wondrous thing I had just discovered. I know what I want to be when I grow up. Everyone looked at me with eager anticipation to see what I had come up with this time. I want to be a ballet dancer. At that moment, time stopped. At that moment, a lot of things stopped, though I wasn't to realize it until later. The four adults in the room remained frozen until Gracie turned and gave Tony a knowing look, although I had no idea what it was she thought she knew. Silence hung heavily in the air. The fluorescent lighting suddenly felt relentless and my mother picked up her purse because she didn't know where to put her hands and she needed to hang on to something as she studied the linoleum floor to avoid everyone's eyes. We remained in suspended animation until my father asked me why I thought I wanted to do that. I told him how the dancers would jump so high and I wanted to be able to do that. He helpfully suggested that maybe I should consider playing football. After all, football players jump through the air too. I knew that his suggestion was not just a way to diffuse the tension of the moment, but it was out of love. My father always loved me. He was always kind and never wavered from that until the day he died. But I think it was the beginning of my realization that he might not have actually liked me. If that statement is confusing to you, then fortunately, you've never had to experience it. If you have experienced it, then you understand how difficult it is to live with. I went back to the living room and watched the end of Ed Sullivan, probably some stand-up comic or some now forgotten singer. I don't remember now, but it doesn't matter. Not a lot seemed to matter after that for a long time. That door I felt open inside me earlier in the evening had been slammed shut. After that, whenever anyone asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would adamantly say, a garbage man. When I was asked why, I would always say, because you don't have to know anything. My school life continued, and I used my imagination to get through a lot of the challenges of growing up. I would immerse myself in books or music math or science, so I didn't have to think about what was going on around me. Everything was fine as long as I could lose myself in it. Toward the end of the fourth grade, my teacher, Mrs. Tollhurst, a six-foot woman who vaguely looked like Loretta Young, gave envelopes to a few of us in the class, which we were told not to open. Instead, we were told to take them home to our parents. We were curious what this was about and why only some of us got them. When I got home, I gave my mother the letter which she opened and read with a look of confused concern on her face. I asked her what it was about and she said something about needing to talk to my father when he got home. When my father got home, my mother took him into the other room while he was still dressed in his police uniform before he even removed his police cap. I peeked through the bedroom door and I saw she had the letter in her hand. There was hushed talking in the room, which was all the more worrisome. When they came out of the bedroom, my mother said that she and my father were asked to come to school to speak with my teacher. 
She asked me if I had done something at school that could be a problem. I said, no, but I started worrying myself. I was only later to find out that the letter referred to putting children like this in a homogeneous group where they could better relate to one another. I can only imagine my mother's concern when her eyes came to the word homogeneous. When my parents returned from their meeting, it was anything other than what I was expecting. Both of them were beaming and smiling at me. My mother hugged me hard and my, mother, my father said, well, they said, kid, you're pretty smart and they're putting you in a special class. That was a good day as I felt I had done something right without actually trying. I then realized my career as a garbage man was now doomed just like my imagined career as a ballet dancer had, had been when my arches decided to go flat so I could feel even more earthbound. Mrs. Tolhurst, who had continued as my teacher for the fifth grade, wanted to do a unit on poetry and she asked each of us if we had any favorite poems. I already knew what poem I would choose since we had a lot of books in our house. One of them was a book of poetry. Tony and Gracie Arena had moved to California and given us all of their books because they, because they would be too expensive to ship. They only wanted to ship the essentials like their 21 inch Zenith. One book we had was the complete work of the complete works of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I read it from cover to cover many times and I loved his works. One of them, The Children's Hour, particularly affected me. It's an idyllic poem about a father's love for his children. And it was accompanied on the facing, facing page by a Victorian watercolor of a mustached father working at his desk by lamplight unaware that his children are peeking at him through the doorway. My home life was at times volatile with surreal arguments between my parents for days at a time due to my mother's emotional problems. I so wished I could be one of the children in the room in that picture. When we brought our poems to school, we were told by Mrs. Tolhurst that we were going to make a collection and then hear all of the poems. She had brought in an enormous reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and we were all going to read our poems into the microphone. Once they were all recorded, she would play them all back for us. It went fairly smoothly, smoothly until the entire collection was taped. The day of the presentation started out uneventfully, one classmate after another being heard from the recorder as the tape reels turned. Then a most peculiar thing happened. Instead of one of my classmates reading their poem, there was a woman's most lovely voice speaking from the recorder. Had Mrs. Tolhurst decided to read a poem? No, it, it wasn't her, but I could not place the voice. Then I recognized between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupation that is known as the children's hour. What I was hearing was my poem being recited in an adult woman's voice. It was not an effeminate boy's voice, but a well-placed resonant voice with precise diction. It could have been Greer Garson. Time stopped again, like it had in Tony and Gracie's kitchen that Sunday night long ago. Again, the fluorescent lights felt relentless, and I wanted this to be over. Unfortunately, the poem is not a very short one like the other students had wisely chosen, and it felt interminable. I was shrinking inside, and I wanted to become invisible. Suddenly, strange happenings in my life began to make sense. Once my father and I had gone on a fishing trip. We would fish all day and then my father would clean and cook them for us and we would have them for dinner. My mother had told me to call her collect from a pay phone when we were there so she would know we were all right. When I went to the phone booth, the long distance operator asked me who she should say was calling when I told her I wanted to place a collect call. 
When I said Paul and the Rocky, she replied, Mrs. Paul and the Rocky? I told her, no, Paul Naraki. Again, she said, Mrs. Paul Naraki. I told her I was a boy and my name was Paul Naraki. When she put the call through, when my mother answered, she told my mother that she had a collect call from Mrs. Paul Naraki. This, of course, upset and confused my mother, who then argued with the operator. It put a blot on what might have been a perfect memory. Now I understood what she was hearing on her end. Now I understood the startled and sometimes uncomfortable looks on people's faces if they were hearing my voice for the first time. From that day until some time after graduating high school, I did everything I could to be invisible. I never raised my hand in class, even if I knew the answer. I would avoid speaking to anyone any time I could in or out of school. And when I did, I would speak softly with the hopes of keeping anyone from hearing me except whomever I was being forced to speak to. Time doesn't heal all wounds. Time's help, time helps you reach a place where the wounds, wounds can become bearable or less important or even enlightening. Eventually, I was able to speak again in full voice. But more importantly, I eventually learned ways to fly despite flat feet. But that's another story. In June of 1963, days after my graduation from the segregated Lincoln High School in Sumter, South Carolina, I received this letter from my aunt who lived up north in Philadelphia. Dear Sarah, I got you a summer job. My friend Claudia Lee is the cook at a fancy camp for rich white girls in Vermont. She says you can be her helper. The job pays $300 plus train fare, room and board. Wish I could have had a chance like this when I was your age. I had to pick cotton and take care of white folks' babies. See you soon. Love and Susie. P.S. This is a real opportunity. Opportunity? Hmm. Cooking for some rich white girl sure isn't an opportunity to me. Times are changing for colored people. Opportunity is joining the lunch counter sit-ins or marching with Dr. Martin Luther King. I was only 17 but I had a heart full of reasons to hate white people and their Jim Crow regulations. I loved to read, but was banned from Sumter's public library. I paid full admission price to the local movie theater, but my access was down a side alley and up a fire escape to seats in the balcony. I even had to sit in the back of city buses, which I refused to do. I just walked everywhere I had to go. One night, during an especially bad asthma attack, I took my mother to the Negro wing of Toomey Hospital. I sat alone in the waiting room while they treated her. After a while, an intern came out. We're keeping her overnight, just for observation, he told me. Don't worry, she'll be all right. Asthma doesn't kill you. The next morning, when I arrived to take my mother home, a blue-eyed, blonde-haired nurse told me that just after dawn, they'd found my mother dead in her bed. Found her dead, I screamed. You were supposed to be observing her. Why'd you leave her alone? You wouldn't have done that if she'd been white. The nurse clenched her lips in a hard line and said, that's unfair. You're the ones who are unfair. My mother's dead and it's your fault. I bolted from the hospital and ran all the way home, tears streaming down my face. But no matter how much I mourned my mother's death, I had to get on with my own life. My acceptance letter from Morgan State College in Baltimore made no mention of a scholarship and the National Defense student loan that I qualified for 
would barely cover tuition, room, and board. While I didn't want a job as a cook's helper, I needed a summer job to make ends meet. As my train headed toward my Philadelphia rendezvous with Mrs. Lee, I leafed through the brochure my aunt had sent along with her letter. From its glossy pages, Camp Bernardino emerged like a mountain sanctuary. It offered sports, which didn't interest me, arts and crafts, drama, and swimming in the camp's very own Lake Ferry. Now, swimming appealed to me. I'd always wanted to learn, but colored people weren't allowed in Sumter's public pool, and Mama's stories about the water moccasins had kept me away from the muddy pond at the edge of town. I planned to learn to swim in Lake Fairley before the summer was over. Aunt Susie was waiting when I stepped off the train in Philadelphia. You look more and more like your mother, she said as she touched my cheek, tears welling in her eyes. I forced myself not to cry as she embraced me. All I ask of you, she answered. Next stop, White River Junction, the conductor announced, swaying from side to side as he navigated the aisle. That's our stop, Mrs. Lee said. I was the last to step from the train onto the wooden platform that stood like an unfinished bridge in a green clearing. Mrs. Lee and five other teenage girls who made up the kitchen crew had already started down the steep staircase at the inn. I paused, listening to the bird calls that drifted from the forest that loomed over the one room station house. This place made Sumter look like a bustling metropolis. A white man beckoned us toward his wood panel station wagon. Hello, Mr. Henry, how are you? Mrs. Lee said to the gangly old man with a scruffy beard. Fine, thank you, he replied while deftly loading our suitcases onto the station wagon's overhead rack and tying them down. The seven of us squeezed inside and embarked on the last leg of our journey. During the long ride to camp, I stared out the window at gargantuan mountains with clouds that looked like smoke rings curling around their tops, picture book like farmhouses nestled in deep valleys, and cows posed on sloping pastures where rounded boulders sprouted like oversized watermelon. The sun had just reached the horizon and filled the sky with a rosy glow when Mr. Henry stopped the car in a clearing near a compound of wooden buildings. This is it. Can't be in the Dewin. You're home away from home for the next seven weeks. Mrs. Lee, the other girls and I quickly settled into the routine of preparing and serving home-cooked meals for 150 people three times a day six and a half days a week. It was cold and dark every morning as I made my way through the pine scented forest to the kitchen where I stirred huge vats of maple, loaded slices of white bread onto an industrial sized toaster, then buttered and pressed each piece into a plate of cinnamon sugar. Under Mrs. Lee's tutelage, I learned to make and enjoy Delicacies like sugar cookies, blueberry pie, clover leaf dinner rolls, and smooth brown gravy ladled over mashed potatoes and slices of roast beef. Each night, after counting the days till camp ended, I fell into an exhausted and dreamless sleep. When I asked Mrs. Lee why we couldn't take part in any camp activities or go near the lake, she said, we're the help. Up here, the help does not mingle with the campers. Despite my anger about camp re restrictions, I was shamelessly curious about the campers. Never before had I been in such close proximity to so many white girls my own age. It seemed as if we were invisible to them 
and day by day, it grew easier to eavesdrop on their conversations. I soon learned that white skin brought no solace for money problems, didn't ensure smooth boy-girl relationships, or prevent sadness and heartache. They had the same problems that I had. I also learned that having two parents at home didn't always make a happy family. Before coming to being a demon, I'd never worked for white people. Mrs. Lee told us to address each camper and counselor, whatever her age, as miss. I said the word only when Mrs. Lee was within hearing range. None of them called me anything except girl. And they said that only when they wanted more of something to eat. During a lull in breakfast one morning, Mrs. Lee pointed to a corner table. They're counselors, college girls like you, she said. They're not college girls like me, I answered. They're white. And I bet they're making a lot more money than I am for a lot less work. Mrs. Lee shrugged. That's how life is. Why do grown up colored folks accept whatever white people say? Just because that's the way it's always been doesn't mean that's the way it has to stay. When I get to be an adult, white folks sure aren't gonna tell me what to do. Every Sunday after our kitchen crew served breakfast, lunch, and prepared box suppers for the entire camp, Mr. Henry took us sightseeing in the camp's station wagon. I surmised from the unfriendly stares our little group always drew that no other colored people had ever lived in or even visited the state of Vermont. An overwhelming sense of first being invisible, then being different, and finally being unwelcome poisoned my entire Vermont experience. The last Sunday afternoon before camp ended, instead of joining the weekly tour, I made a pilgrimage to the forbidden Lake Fairley. The well-worn path there took me through a stand of pine trees where brown needles cushioned the cool pathway. I considered staying there in the shade, but the persistent gnats and summer flies made me press on. When the path reached Lake Fairley, I stopped overwhelmed by its beauty and size. It extended as far as I could see. Tall trees cloaked in feathery foliage protectively surrounded it. To my right, several rowboats were tied to a wooden dock. To my left, the pathway disappeared into the lake. I swatted a mosquito on my arm and scratched at the resulting sting. It was minor compared to the deep sting that tortured my heart. I fought back tears. What gave these white people the right to keep me from going into this lake? They didn't make it, God made it. Didn't I deserve to enjoy its coolness too? I took off my sandals and walked down to the bank, but at the water's edge, I stopped and looked around. What if someone saw me? The thought of getting caught chilled my bravery. My heart beat faster and I could almost hear my mother's voice, Sarah, don't make trouble. Go back to that cabin right now. I ignored the voice and waded into the lake. The sun was hot against my top half while the water made my feet icy cold. It was a tantalizing feeling. I squished the mud on the bottom between my toes and a cloud swirled around my feet. I lifted my skirt and waded farther out. The water was now midway my thighs. I shivered with delight, tucked my skirt in my waistband and bent to splash cool water on my mosquito bitten arm. Suddenly, I was angry. 
at the campers, at the selfishness of all the white people in Vermont, at the unfairness of life that showed me its bounty but denied me access at myself for my helplessness and fear. I began to cry and strike at the water with my palms. I wanted to punish those people, but how? Then it came to me. Since they thought I would contaminate their beautiful lake, I decided to do something that would. Slowly and deliberately, I waded back to the water's edge, lowered my cotton panties, squatted and peed. When I hugged Lauren in the lobby of her hotel on the Upper West Side just now, the first time I'd done that since college, her silky blossom fragrant hair reminded me instantly of her as a girl and me as a boy. An ancestral twinge of the desire I'd once acted upon arose as we re-embraced to where I thought, am I more flexible than I thought all these years? Could what have happened then happen again? As we slid deep into a scallop-shaped booth in the hotel's dining room, she sipping a double scotch on the rocks I in Manhattan, I detected the first time in these 35 years since symptoms of the jealousy and wounding from when I first knew her. You see, Lauren had been the girlfriend of my then best college friend. Mark knew I loved him, but because he was so innately tolerant, he accepted it, just never encouraged me to act on it. I wrote him poems, left small gifts on his bedspread, even played in his basketball league, double dribbling every game, the shrieks of a ref's whistle echoing in the gym, acknowledging my errors. It was Lauren who had explained that double dribbling was a violation of the rules, that pausing with the ball mid-court to assess the situation, then starting again was not allowed. Once you stop, you have to give the ball up to someone else, she said. Lauren would sleep over with Mark at our house in the Ann Arbor student ghetto. I was so naive about sex that I mistook the retainer she'd leave on the bathroom sink every night for a diaphragm. Sometimes I'd try to stay away the entire night when she was there, bicycling so far into town neighborhoods that I could make out the glow of distant Detroit, or I'd sleep on our porch chaise because I couldn't bear knowing that down the hallway from my room, she and Mark were together, making love with the kind of fury and passion that young people do. Laura knew of my feelings for Mark, and she'd sometimes knock on my door in the early evening after dinner and sit cross-legged with me on the wooden floor to reassure me that Mark loved me too, just in a different way, as did she. But she said something in the hotel now that startled me, a conclusion I'd thought my own. I think you fell for me because I was as close to Mark as you could get she said. We let that proclamation settle until our ice cubes snapped. She went on. I was a fallen woman for doing what we did together. Here I am describing myself now as a serial monogamist with men and women, by the way. But way back then, I was straying and betraying Mark, she said. And for the first time, I realized I had betrayed Mark as my friend those many years back, and I felt a concussive shame. He would not have done that to me. I reminded Lauren of our first time in that neo-Gothic law library, sacred in its non-sectarian splendor. We discovered a windowless study room within the building, and there we went for so long that the library closed all around us and we found ourselves locked inside. We set off alarms as we, as we raced through a fire exit out into the campus. I've no recollection of that, she said. 
Yet for me, it was not only my first moment with a girl, but also the most significant of our being together. But I do remember our going to the Arboretum one morning and making dew angels in the tall grass, she said. We had a connection, I, I can say that. That she remembered. As we reminisced in the booth, votives a flicker about the dark lounge like the planetarium star shows she and I used to attend at school, vectors appearing on the dome, linking stars to reveal Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. We now touched shoulders, knees, inhaled our sense, ancient in their familiarity. I wasn't sure I'd known it before, but I think that once we love someone romantically, we love them always. Then it's akin to getting some ultimately healthy virus that stays in the body, dormant, seemingly inert, but which under the right circumstances reactivates the original symptoms, though a weaker strain. When you see someone again after decades, someone who really is interested in knowing everything about your life, whatever you say about how you've occupied your life just doesn't seem like anything or enough. A succession of offices with different titles on the door, Apartments with skyline views, others opening onto pigeon cooing air shafts. In-laws who are no longer that because they're no longer in your life. Here's something I told Lauren. I remember taking you to that diner on State Street and holding you so tightly in the threshold while we waited for a table that some old woman crossed the street and came up to me to say, like it was something she couldn't wait to say, you really love this girl. And what did you say to her? Lauren asked, her question indicating that this was yet another memory that only I held. I said that I did. Lauren took a sip of her drink that made her wince. I didn't tell Lauren that when I first fell for her, I had confessed such to my mother, not someone I would have chosen as my confidant. My mother had recently been left by my father for another woman with whom he remained the rest of his life. My mother stayed in the house in suburban Chicago, and while she was involved in many literary causes, wrote essays for the Chicago papers, played championship bridge and traveled abroad with friends, she was forever wounded by my father's leaving. Whenever I was home from college on break, I would sometimes hear her on the back porch in the middle of the night crying or muttering in a controlled rage but she was surprisingly open to hearing my candid admissions of desire for Lauren. Oddly, my mother would say whenever I alluded to the situation in my Ann Arbor house during one of our phone calls, I want you to ravish her. Do that, I'm telling you. Apart from the odd Wuthering Heights-esque verb choice, I was shocked by her push for me to go all the way. My mother was both an enlightened and yet naive woman when it came to such matters. When I elaborated on the situation, how Lauren was the girlfriend of Mark, but how she was making it clear that she was interested in me too, even as she was sleeping with him just rooms away from mine, my mother said something that brought me comfort. You know what's happening there in your house? What, I said, it's like a drawing room comedy. She said, referring to the genre's farcical plot lines of wacky overlapping romances in which characters never seem to be really hurt by infidelities and sexual peccadilloes, more miffed than wounded. Pretend you're living one of those storylines, people going in one door, out another, missing each other by a moment. Laugh about it, but do ravish her. After several such conversations, the house phones wire snaking under my bedroom door, I asked my mother, why are you encouraging this? She paused, the Carol Burnett show playing in the background of my boyhood home in Illinois and said, because I know your secret. My secret, I said, is both question and statement. Yes, I found those letters in your desk from that pen pal of yours at the University of Chicago, she said with an edge of derision. Both of you are sharing your exploits with other boys. 
where the letters from that pen pal described the, his visits to sex dungeons and S&M encounters in the back rooms of Chicago gay bars, I had instead recounted to him tales of resting a hand on a fellow student's knee at a football game and wondering if that meant mutual attraction or even love. But all my mother had as information was his information. Apart from the realization of her having found the letters, my mother and I never again spoke of their content, baffling even to me in their candor. All my life, I remained haunted by the idea that she thought I was leading a similar kind of gay life to that of my pen pal. In my junior year of college, the cure, she was convinced, lay in my lying with Lauren. Lauren and I watched the waitress moving throughout the hotel lounge, the clink of empty glasses ringing as she gathered them with splayed fingers. Seems they're closing, Lauren said, blowing out candles or stars, as you say. There's a roof deck here, she said, raising her eyes to the ceiling. It's a clear night. We could go up and see the real things in the sky. You don't live in Manhattan, I said. There won't be any stars to see. Then we could keep talking in my room here, upstairs. After I didn't respond, she said, stirring the last of the ice cubes with a finger, I know, middle-aged, these, parentheses, she said, tracing the sides of her mouth. You'll never be parenthetical to me, I said. You'll always be an active verb. And who isn't older? We both occupy the middle ground, I said, choosing my preferred phrase for middle-aged. It's the right place to be, still surrounded by everything that matters, still amid things. Before the waitress could do so, as she cleaned up the tables in the room, I blew out the votive on our table. As the smoke cleared, I leaned over and kissed Lauren's parentheses. It was 1 a.m. Time for me to leave the hotel and head home. Sarah, there's a um, lot of comments, a very nice comments for you. Um, your maybe a niece, Sherry, says bravo, and Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, family watching um, the first question is also for Sarah this is from Linda has your opinion changed about your Vermont experience now that many years have passed if yes how <laughs> yes it has changed it took a Vermont intervention by four friends, one of whom has a house in Vermont. And she convinced me to go back and little did I know she had sent Dean when he was governor of Vermont to my website to read a version of this essay. And when I arrived at her house, she handed me a FedEx package from the governor apologizing for what had happened all those years ago and telling me that Vermont had changed. So that weekend, my friends took me around and introduced me to a wonderful Vermont that I've come to love enough that I go once a year with friends. That's great, that's good to hear. <laughs> uh, the next question is for Paul, uh, starting with a comment. This is uh, from Linda as well. Uh, she's saying wonderful details. Love the references to the times, Gria Garson, Lorda Young, Ed Sullivan Show, well done. Um, and she's saying she might have missed it, but how old were you in your piece? Uh, like uh, five or six. Well, initially I was five or six. It covers a number of years because by the time um, by the time the recording happened, it was probably, I was probably, I don't know, 11, maybe. Okay, great. Um, Linda, I know you have some questions prepared for our uh, playwrights as well, correct? Yes. Um, one question, usually we listen to and watch actors do monologues 
what is the difference when playwrights and writers do monologues? <laughs> I'll begin. Um, this was a little different. Um, as a writer, I tend to hide behind my words. And when I met Linda, when I was introduced to Linda and she began to pull the drama out of my piece, it made me step into an unusual position. It was an actor brings life to the words. It's not a matter of using um, accents for the Vermont driver or whatever. It's the, the feel of it. And it made me have to go back and feel the pain of the piece in order to share it with you. So in writing, you feel the experience, then you write about the experience and you try to forget about the experience. And when you have to perform it, I experienced it again. I experienced the cold water of the lake. So that's what the difference was for me. I don't know how everybody else feels. I just want so Go ahead. David? I just want to say too that uh, I write a lot about my parents. And even though my parents have been, have been going a long time, I still hear their voices. I still hear their cadence. Well, I, I, I know what they're going to say, what they said, and what they might say in a piece. And that's one of the things about writing a monologue and writing a memoir is, is, is this verbatim um, material that my mother said, that's exact, this is exactly how I remember it. So I feel that it's very accurate. Chances are the word choice is not exactly the same, but I know these people. And as for the other character, Lauren, this is somebody I just recently met. So it still echoes in my head and to me, writing dialogue is one of the most fun things to do because it divorces, you, you divorce yourself from it and you can uh, elaborate and embroider and nobody knows that it's not accurate <laughs> or verbatim. And Paul, how did you feel? Well, I, everything that, that was in my piece is pretty much exactly as it happened and as I remember it. And in the same way, you know, you when you're reading things that, that happened, that had an impact on you, it does affect you. Okay? you it, it's difficult to not have it affect you. Do, you. do you mind being affected by it as a writer? No, no. I think it, you, have to, you have to open up yourself to express yourself if you want your writing to be good. If, if it affects you, it'll probably affect the audience, you know? Yes. I know My I've, I've always been impressed with uh, songwriters who can't sing like Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, and yet when they sing their songs, they have a truth that nobody touches because it comes from the root of the experience. Yeah. Do we still have more time? Yes. I was in a Vermont bookstore lamenting the fact that there were so many books in the world already. Why would writers even bother to write another book? And the bookstore owner overheard my conversation and came over and said it's because you have a unique story. And she knew nothing about me. And she said, a lot of these things you read were people who just got the opportunity to get a book published and they all aren't great books. But if you don't write your story down, it will never get a chance to be out in the world for other people. And I'm always surprised at how people identify with my book. Primary Lessons is not a book that had the subject matter that all the New York Times um, bestsellers had. It's a simple story about a colored family in South Carolina in the 50s and 60s. I'm amazed by the fact that people from different races, sexes, ethnic groups, locations will say to me, your story is my story, or 
share, share some experience that's so similar to mine. And you realize that most people live lives that if they were writers, they could write books about. And I think that's why there's a proliferation of people who self-publish stories about their lives because they write them down to share. And I really began to write my story down to make peace with the ambivalence I had about my mother. And I didn't know other people would be interested in it, but I poured my personal emotion onto the page. And as my editor said to me at the end, if the writer doesn't feel the emotion as they write it, the reader will not feel it as they read it. It's so interesting because I don't know how many of you know this, but actors all over the United States are not acting. <laughs> Equity actors are not working. It's really a terrible situation. I don't know if you know this, but in order to get health care, equity actors have to work to build up credits for health care. So now they are no longer acting and they are no longer able to get health care. And uh, as someone said, this is so interesting because you're doing writers. Will it be that the writers will have to do the acting now because equity actors won't be able to act because their union has not come together with other unions to make an agreement so actors can act? It's a very interesting uh, time that we're living in. And I think one of the reasons I love all of your pieces is um, that it's so personal, it's so actable, and it's so theatrical, and yet it's literary. Would you do it again? <laughs> Sure. Sure. Everybody's a ham at heart, actually. <laughs> That's true. This is the perfect forum for this. Thank you, Linda. Yes. Um, I must say that in speaking of the forum, we're all on new ground with Zoom. And during my reading, I have no idea what you saw, but I lost my internet connection. Yes, we saw it. You froze. <laughs> we froze up. with you. <laughs> and I panicked because I had to go in and restart it. And I had no idea whether I'd come back into it. But um, I watched enough theater to know that you're supposed to just act like it was a part of the thing. But no, that was not a part of what was going on. And I had a serious case of panic here today. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, there were New York Times came out with an article, Ben Bradley, that, that, that Bradley was in England, and he said, the medium that does the best on Zoom are monologues. Ah. And so now a lot of people are doing monologues. Audience, what do you feel about it? Can you add some of your uh, comments to what we're talking about? Because you know we do this for you. The chat comments are overwhelmingly positive. Um, you all did a great job in spite of technology. Well done, Sarah. <laughs> uh, worked it like a pro. Um, everybody really enjoyed the um, all the monologues. Um, on behalf of the National Arts Club, I before I turn it over to Linda to close out the evening, um, I want to thank, of course, Paul, Sarah, and David for three wonderful monologues. I want to thank Linda and the entire theater committee of the National Arts Club for making it all possible. And I'm going to close it out from my part with a comment from a member of our audience who writes, every one of you wrote and spoke extraordinary stories from your lives, so individual and yet universal. 
I'm not like any of you. My experience are not like yours, and yet I'm like all of you. My oh. experience are like yours. Bravo and thank you. Oh, we have to end on that because that's exactly exactly why we presented it tonight in this pandemic world that we live in with our love and desire for theater and literature and the sharing of humanity. Thank you, thank you all of you. And come to our next show, which will be a musical, very different. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Bye.